Hey, beautiful friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Robin Graham show. I have a very special guest with me today. I know, I know I say that all the time that my guest is very special, but truly they all are. And today is no different. I'm going to start by reading an excerpt from Kate's book. And the book is titled Do What You Love. So we're going to dive into this really deeply in just a few minutes. So stay tuned. Fortunately, it is never too late to become a better you. You may have made decisions in the past that you wish you could do over. While we can't jump in a time machine and go back, it is possible to make better decisions starting today. It is never too late to start doing what you love. Exploring what we love encourages us to look toward the future. We get to take lessons we have learned from our past and use them to build a better future. We get to choose how we show up in the world. It does not matter how old or young you are, where you live, or what you do for a living. Every day is a chance to explore your creativity and build a better life for yourself. Now, I started with that because I wanted to put the entire conversation into perspective. No matter where you are today on your journey, there's always an opportunity to create something new, something better. And when we talk about create, we actually have those opportunities. But when we in, tap into the creativity that God instilled in us when we were born, but unfortunately, life and the chaos and everything that we have on our plates often holds us back from tapping into that as a resource to really create a better life. So that's what we're going to dive into today. And I'm super excited because I love this topic. Without further ado, Kate Bullman, welcome to The Robin Graham Show. Robin, thank you so much for having me. I just, I'm like, it's so interesting to hear somebody read your work out loud. It's so, it's, it's, it's so lovely. And you have such a beautiful voice. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. It, it's funny that you say that I interviewed Melanie Wilson, another Floridian actually. Um, and her episode just aired recently. And I read something from her book too. And she was like, I just got goosebumps because I've never heard anybody read what I wrote, but I think it's really, it's really special. And I like to in, do that as an intro because it gives people insight into what you've written, but, and how you write, but also what we're going to talk about. And I love the conversation around creativity and how we can use creativity to grow our businesses, to become happier, to have better relationships. There's just so many things that creativity can do for us and, and our overall um, perspective of our lives. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And and it's one of the reasons why I was so excited to write the book because I I see firsthand every day how many people are giving up their creative pursuits and some of the things that really they find so much joy in because, you know, life gets in the way and you have to do all the things that you need to do and be responsible. But our creativity really fuels every area of, of our life. And so we have to make sure that no matter where we are, and what we want to create, that creativity plays a role in helping us to fulfill our dreams. Yeah, absolutely. So before we dive too deep into the conversation, will you tell the listeners what inspired you to write the book and what brought you to this point in your journey to actually write and publish the book? Yeah. So, and I talk about this in the book because writing a book has been a dream of mine for, it was, I mean, it was on my dream list for a decade, which is so sad to say, because, hey, we should be definitely a, a, taking action on our dreams before that. But I work with so many people that have a dream of writing a book. I mean, you're an author, you know what it takes to actually sit down and, and write all the things that you could be, that you think about so often. And one day I finally just decided, hey, this dream that I've had, I need to get it out. Like I need to finally write a book. It's something I've been talking about. It's something that I have been really passionate about doing and I've dabbled, right? A lot of us, we dabble in that work and I started writing things here and there and I probably have five different books on my computer, half written, half not, just ideas. <laughs> and because of the work that I get to do, I, I run a coaching company and we I just work with so many incredible people and 
I just kept seeing all these themes show up. And I feel very blessed because I have been someone who in my work, in the work that I've done, I've always tapped into my creativity. I've worked for other people. I've had my own business. I've, I've kind of done and seen it all. And no matter where I was, I always made time for my creative pursuits. I always made time to produce, like to create videos and to explore what that was like. I mean, this is way back when, before social media was even a thing and YouTube just came out and I thought, oh, this is cool. I want to, I mean, I'm curious about video. What does that look like? And starting to put those up and then podcasting came out and just kind of dabbling in that. And so, uh, but that really helped me to live a fun life where no matter what I was doing for work, I was always tapping into stuff. And fortunately, the work that I chose to do for a living, it lended itself nicely to some of the creative projects that I enjoyed. So I was able to say, hey, let's do some video. I, I worked at a chamber of commerce. So we did some video for businesses. And so I was able to kind of infuse the two. And I think that also is what really helped advance in my career as well, because another role that I took after I left my first role was someone who really loved the fact that I wanted to explore my creativity and some of these new ways of marketing and new ways to really uh, get in touch with the business owners that we were working with and then uh, the local community that we were marketing to. And so, uh, so yeah, so I was like, so finally one day I decided I was going to do it. And I will say that it it really took that definitive, this is it. I'm, I, I have to put a goal. I have to put a date on this goal and I need to decide on a writing habit and write every day and figure out how I'm going to create the best work that I can create. And for me, that meant hiring a coach. Like I hired a coach and, and I really knew that I needed someone that was going to help me not only hold me accountable, which is so incredibly important. And one of the reasons why we don't achieve the things we, we say we want to, because we don't hold ourselves accountable. So I needed to hold myself accountable, but also I wanted to become a better writer. I knew that I wanted, if I was going to do my best work and put something out into the world that I, that I was proud of, that I knew that would resonate with people, then I thought I, I have to develop some of those skills because I, I write for fun, but I wasn't a professional writer by any means. And so it was a really fun challenge and process to be part of because I learned and grew in so many different skills and it also enhanced my creativity. So the whole process was really unique and fun. I love that so much. And yes, as the listeners know, I wrote a book also, and it is so good to have someone who says to you, I need this draft by X date because yes. otherwise, and you talked about this in the book, procrastination or waiting until it's perfect. And when we wait until things are perfect, we almost never get them done. And I'll never forget when I was, John and I had not been married that long. And, you know, we were already approaching 30 and people were like, well, when are you going to have kids? When are you going to, well, we're not ready yet. We want to do this. We want to do that. And my dad would say, you keep waiting until it's perfect never going to happen. And I was like, Oh, what do you know, dad? You know, of course now <laughs> I give anything to have him say that to me again, but um, it's just, it's so true. The longer we wait, the less likely we are to do it. So when we have someone to hold us accountable, it pushes us forward so that we don't hold ourselves back. So, I, but I would love for you to talk about that because I know that, you know, you mentioned in the book too, that perfectionism has been something you've strived for over the years. So or your friends have strived for and, you know, different people, you know, so I would love to have you talk a little bit about that and how, how when we want to improve our life or even just enhance it a little bit through creativity, how do we not let that perfectionism hold us back? Oh, it's such a big, it's such a big question, right? Because so we, so many of us, I'm sure that your listeners are the kind of people that are very, they're growth minded. They're listening to you, right? They're getting all of these really <laughs> great inspiration from all your incredible guests and from you. I love your episodes where you share just kind of your wisdom uh, that we can walk away with. And it's, so they're growth minded and uh, probably type A, probably have a lot on their plate, probably doing all the things 
and wanting everything they do to be perfect. And so it really, it takes practice to let go of perfectionism. It takes practice to let go of something and put it out into the world, even when you know it's Look, nothing is perfect, right? We know that perfect doesn't exist. And yet we still grab so hold of this concept that we can, we will be the people that make something perfect without any flaws. And that is just not true. And so we have to make the decision that, hey, what I'm creating, what I'm putting out into the world, and whether somebody wants to write a book or do videos or a podcast, any of those things, I work with so many people that have those as dreams. And yet, they won't share their work. They won't put it out. They're waiting for, well, I don't have the right technology. I don't have the right systems. It's not the, it, the my book, it's, I still need to make some tweaks and changes, but at some point you have to let it go. You have to just say, I'm going to let this out into the world. I'm going to let go of it. And then I'm going to move on to the next thing. And then you, you know that everything that you've learned and developed, all the skills you've developed by the time and attention you put in this one project, you can now move over to the next project and make something even better. But without those experiences, then we have nothing to go off of. And so so I, I, I sometimes wonder how many books or videos or podcasts or poems or music or or pieces of art that are just not out into the world because the creator believes that it's just not good enough they have it's too flawed and but that's what we want to see like we want to see we how we love seeing people who have made so much progress and you look back at some of their work and then you get to see oh wow this person now going back there are so many flaws and and the creator themselves, they see all the flaws in their work, but other people really see so much beauty in it. And so we have to let go of perfectionism in every area of our life, right? Like if in order for us to, the only way for us to move forward is to let go of perfectionism, to know it'll never exist. And then just to, to really just show some, uh, some faith in the fact that this is the best work that I can do at the time that I did it. And now I get to move on and create something even better. Mm -hmm. I love that. And the most beautiful thing is that we learn as we go. But if we yeah. don't take action, if we just stay stuck, we don't learn and we don't grow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You have to. Oh, it's perfectionism. We we don't like we don't like the messy middle, right? Like we don't like the messy middle of anything, whether it's a creative project or the messy middle of if you are changing, changing careers or doing something, anything new, we don't like that messy middle. I remember when I was writing the book, I mean, look, we all, we, we've all had these feelings with perfectionism, you know, in my book, I share the seven myths, stopping people from pursuing their passions. And myth number six is it has to be perfect. So I get it. I mean, I deal with this all day long. And so um, Matthew, so uh, Matthew Kelly, who um, I know you are a big fan of, he I remember he told me, cause I was talking about the book and I was like in the late stages of it and we're getting, and it's about to get published and all the things. And I just was, he's like, how are you feeling? I'm like, I'm really nervous. Like to get my creative work out in the world. Like this is like nerve wracking, you know, it's one thing to put up a blog post or to have a video that you could potentially take down, but a published book is a whole other thing. And yeah. so he said, he gave me the, some of the best advice. And I love sharing this with anyone that's creating anything, but especially authors. He said, after you write the book, it's no longer yours. It's meant for the reader. Like it belongs to the reader. And I thought, oh my gosh, I love that because so much of what I, <clears throat> what I wrote, I was thinking, oh, why did I write it in this way? Or I should have shared this story, or I don't know if I would have said that now in the same way. And, but to someone who's reading it, they're like highlighting it and taking notes and it might really resonate with them. And so I loved, I loved that. And I think that can pertain to anything in the creative process. It's almost like, let it go and let it be out in the world. And even when I say out in the world, it doesn't mean that it's meant for millions of people. It could just be out in the world and maybe one person sees it, or maybe no one sees it, but regardless it's out there and you created it. And as long as it did something for you, that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. I love that. And it's, it's really something to remember too, because art is subjective, but yeah. to me, you know, writing is an art, especially poetry, but writing, painting, photography, 
woodwork, sculpting, pottery, any of that is a form of artistry. And it's all going to be subjective. So we have to give ourselves that grace too, that whether it, whether it's perfect or not, it's which most likely it's never going to be, it's going to resonate with people that it's meant to resonate with. And it's not going to resonate the way you want it to with other people because we're all so unique and we see life differently. We see things differently that we're never going to please everybody. So it's, yeah, yeah very subjective. Yeah. Um, so in the book, because I know that so many people are so busy and life is so chaotic that we forget to take time to tap into our creativity. And oftentimes, and I know I've asked this when I've been speaking, you know, I've asked the audience, so how many of you have said, I don't have a creative bone in my body, or I'm not creative at all. And all these hands are raised. And I'm like, oh, but you do have creativity. We're born with that in our brain. But life throws us all these curveballs. And so we're dodging all these different things. And we forget to tap into our creativity. And for those people who are struggling to take the time or make the time to do that, I would love for you to talk about the return on creativity. I love this concept. So we talk all the time about business and return on investment. And I could talk about that till the cows come home. But I love this concept of return on creativity. Yeah, I <laughs> so yes. So like return on investment in business, we we love talking about that, right? If we're gonna spend X amount of dollars on marketing, what is my return? And then I know that I can invest more and more on whatever that is. So we get that. But return on creating is different. It's your rock. So I often will share with people, especially those that say, I don't have time to play golf or pursue my passions or whatever it is. And so it's an it's this idea of reminding us that, hey, when we make time for our creativity, when we say, hey, I'm going to make this time, whether it's one once a day, once a week, once a month, whatever it is, to go do something that you really love and enjoy, what does that bring to your life? Like, what is that your rock? What is the return on creating? And that those are things like it brings you so much energy right? Like if you're just working away in your office all day long, we've all experienced this. We're like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do, I'm, I'm going to finish the work. I'm going to stay behind my computer because I have all these deadlines when really we're so fatigued, we're so burnt out. We would do better if we just went out and took a walk or picked up the phone and called a friend or went and did art. If you love drawing or painting or whatever, or photography, go take your phone and take some pictures outside that return on creating is huge. So we have to decide what is that? Do you see when you are doing something that you really love, when you're exploring one of your creative pursuits, singing, dancing, art, photography, whatever it is for you, when you're finished with that, how do you feel? Like, what are you noticing? Do you have more energy? Like, what is it bringing to your personal relationships? I bet when you come home, after you take that dance class that you love or that yoga class that you love that you kept putting off, when you come home and if you're married, you see your significant other and you come home and I bet you're in a good mood. I bet you have a way more time, better time with them than if you just came home from the office because you were trying to trudge through all of your work. And so that is what your return on creating is. It's really giving yourself permission because sometimes our business brains, we do that, right? We have to be like, no, no, no. If I'm going to do something, there has to be an outcome. There has to be this uh, this return on investment. And so great, your return on creativity. What is it? Like, what do you notice happens after you spend some time creating? And those are the things that people come up with. Like they feel happier. They feel more energized. They feel more engaged. They feel more creative, right? They mm -hmm. might be dealing with a challenge. I can't tell you how many CEOs I've worked with who will say, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I finally made time to play my guitar or to write or to go and spend some time with my son outside just shooting hoops. And they finally came up with a solution to a challenge they've been trying to think about in their office for the whole week. Like we forget that these things are really important. I say in the book, our creative pursuits, they're not a nicety. They're not this thing that we do when we have extra time. They are something that they fuel us. They fill us with joy. Like they are a necessity in our life if we're going to become the best version of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason that is, is because we open up those neural pathways in our brain, right? 
when we're stressed and we're, we're doing something and trying to solve problems all day long or coming up with strategies or implementing different things, we're, we're constantly focused and all of that energy is going towards like one thing or multiple things, but we're not able to relax and just let the positive hormones, neurochemicals float around in our brain. So when we do something creative and that joy bubbles up, we're releasing, I mean, even smiling releases serotonin. So the more we can do to release those positive neuro, this is where my nerdy science brain comes into play. But, you know, what the more we can do to change those neural pathways in our brain and increase the positive neurochemicals that are floating around, the happier we're going to be. So therefore, the the better our relationships are going to be, the more productive we're going to be. And there's so much science to that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love the science. I, I, I geek out when I get to talk to people like you who know all the science behind it. Like, <laughs> like, uh, you know, I studied a lot of, uh, like Stephen Kotler's work and all around flow and like that whole, that is fascinating to me. Just this idea of that we can get into this state of flow where we feel like we're doing something and just time goes by. Cause we're in it. We're in our, we're in our essence. We're in, we're just in that, that, in the state of flow, like, like a lot of yeah. athletes get right. You get into that space where you're just, Oh, you know, that you're doing what is meant for you when you're in that state. And so what, it, what are you doing when you get that way? Those yeah. are the, those are the places that we need to play more often. Yeah. I love that so much. So you, you talked about overthinking and we see this so much in entrepreneurship And, you know, the listeners know that I'm all about building that foundation for your business first before you go onto social media. And if you're going to go onto social media, it's got to have a purpose. There's got to be a reason, whether it's to build relationships, you know, grow your community, but it's, it's got to have a purpose. It's not the end all be all for digital marketing. And one of the reasons I say that is because it does stimulate a lot of overthinking. And especially type A people who do tend to be perfectionists, we overthink about everything and we end up in a place of indecision. And so you have a whole section in the book on overthinking. And I just want to share these statistics that you brought up. And then I want your perspective on this. Um, A study from the University of Michigan found that 73% of adults between the ages of 25 and 35 overthink, as do 52% of people 45 to 55. So you guys, these age groups are us, the audience, me, you know, like we fall into these numbers and it, it is so profound because the more we overthink, and I'm going to link an episode that I did specifically, like only on overthinking um, and what happens when we overthink. So I would love your perspective your perspective. I was reading something in the book and I added that ING, sorry, (laughs) (laughs) your perspective on overthinking and how creativity, how that plays into creativity. Well, first I'm going to listen to your episode because uh, I love hearing uh, people talk about, about overthinking, why it happens and then techniques for, to use to get out of overthinking because this is the, this just stops us, right? Like we overthink our way out of our dreams, out of a decision. I mean, this is just what we do. And it, and it all stems from perfectionism too, right? We, we need it to be perfect. So we're going to overthink until we decide that it's, I mean, we, when we overthink, we just are stuck in this vicious cycle. It's almost like we're not going to ever get out of it because we play all of these stories in our head. We think about the worst case scenario, which is so crazy, right? I mean, we we are so good about thinking about all the reasons why it's not going to work, all the reasons why we shouldn't pursue our passions, our dreams, or start the podcast, write the book, do the videos, whatever it is. And instead, we can make the decision to choose to figure out and come up with all the reasons why it is going to work. And so we get into this, we just get so caught up in our own heads that it's so debilitating. Like we cannot move forward when we're in a state of overthink because we're thinking the same thoughts over and over, right? I mean, we've all experienced that. You're like, wait a second, now I've come full circle. I started someplace and now I'm thinking about all the reasons why it's not going to work. And then you literally come back to the starting point when you could have taken all that time and just done the work and be done with it. Like, that's the thing that's so crazy is that (laughs) it stops us from doing so much. And 
I think um, one of the best books that I've ever read on Overthink is uh, John Acuff's book, Soundtracks. And oh, it yeah. is an incredible resource. And he shares, when you start to overthink, he talks about the three question or he's uh it's it's three questions to ask yourself to help you stop overthinking and they're beautiful questions and it says um is it uh is it true is it thought uh is it true is it oh my gosh i'm gonna forget them is it true is it kind and there's a third one that he says but beautiful questions because we need to stop ourselves is it true no is it kind no, you're not being kind to yourself when you're overthinking. And when we can recognize that we are overthinking, then we can put a plan in place to just do the thing and move on. But it takes a lot of practice. You know, yeah, I it say does. it so easily, right? Like just stop overthinking, but it's a practice. It's something that is challenging to do because we can get so stuck in our heads. Yeah. And so the, there's something so key about this too. And you say it in the book that you have to recognize when you're doing it first and foremost, but then you have to change the cycle and to change yes. the cycle, you have to take action and action is the cure for overthinking. So I would yep. love for, I would love your perspective on, on, on that. Cause I mean, I liked how you put it in the book and it's so funny because that's a big part of my book too. You know, when we're, of course my book was more on anxiety and creativity was just like a small part of how you can navigate anxiety. But when we're in that state of, of anxiety or overthinking or fear or doubt, the only way we're going to get out of that is to take action. Whether you yeah. pick up a pen and paper and start writing down what you're questioning in your head and you see how actually it's silly a lot of times it is, right? And then you can write down the, the positive alternative and it makes it so much easier to make a decision, but it, it is taking action. So I would love, your, yeah. I would love for you to share, share that too. Yeah. So two things. One, I just remembered the last thing. It was, it, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it kind? So those are the yes, questions to helpful. ask yourself. Is it helpful? No, it's not helpful to overthink. Um, and yeah, action. So action is the only way. It is the only way out of our head. It is the only way to move forward. It is the only way to get out of perfectionism is to take action. And what does that mean? That means literally the next right step, right? Like I have a lot of people that will say, I don't know what to do. And so I'll ask them, okay, but if you did, what would you do? Because we know, we know what we need to do next. It's just, we're scared to do it or saying you don't know what to do is another form of procrastination. So mm -hmm. we get to call ourselves out and say, no, the next right step. And it's the simplest thing. And this, this is what I have a in my book. I talk about the passion loop and the passion loop. How do you break through the passion loop? And the passion loop is simply, it's a, it, it is a lot about overthinking because we have this thought of, I want to start a podcast. And almost immediately we say, I don't have the right tech equipment. I, who would even be on the show? Who am I? There's millions of podcasts out there. Why should you, we make all these excuses? Yep. There's the passion loop. We make all these excuses in our minds and then we don't do anything, right? So those excuses are all that, those overthinking comments that we're making in our head. And so the only way to break out of the passion loop is to do it anyway, take action. And by that, it could be the smallest thing. If you want to start a podcast, I, I have a lot of people that say they want to start some type of creative work, whether it's a blog, a podcast, a newsletter or something. And again, it always comes back to technology. And I don't know, I'm like, what is, what is the one thing you can do? I was talking to this one lady, she wanted to, um, to start a newsletter. And I, and I said to her, we were talking, she was like, well, I don't know if I should do use this technology or this piece or what should she's going on, and on about all the things that don't really matter. And I said to her, wait, hold on. I have a question for you. Have you written the first newsletter? Like, what is it about? Have you actually written one? And she said, no, <laughs> I said, Okay. So how about you start there and you literally just write one, like one piece, like, what do you want to send out? And then she said, but I don't have anyone to send it to. And I go, do you know five people in your world that would say, yeah, I'm curious to hear what you have to say. And she said, yeah. I said, great. Send it to them. 
Like literally that is the one thing. Now, what does that do? That takes us out of overthink. And now we're thinking, and are those big things? No, they're not, but they are because it's the, the thing that's going to inspire you to do more, to create more. And what I show in the passion loop that in the book is when you take the next right step, what happens immediately? You see new opportunities, you create new experiences, you gain new skills, you, you, all of these new doors open up and that's the beauty of starting. And so when we overthink and we think I'm just going to, you know, one of the, one of the best, mm, one of those, those pieces that, uh, that is that people think they're doing work, but they're really just procrastinating is research. I'm going to research. What's the right thing? What should I do? No, no, no. You can get stuck in the loop of I'm watching all the YouTube videos. I'm reading all the blogs. I've got to listen to one more podcast. No, no, and no, you need to take action. And and only by doing the things can you open your eyes to other opportunities. And so uh, as you can see, I'm super passionate about this because I, I just know that it holds so many people back and I, and yes. it's held me back so yeah. many times in my, in my career and in the creativity, the creative work that I've done, I have definitely uh, experienced this. And I know I feel better when I take the first right step, when I take that little baby step and, but it feels like a giant leap when you're done because you did it. And then it pushes you to other, to the, to the next step and the next, and then you can keep going. And then you're creating this, uh, th you're just creating a lot of momentum around your creative work, which is beautiful. Absolutely. That's where we all want to be. Absolutely. As you were talking, my mind was thinking, yes, progress creates momentum, which then we have more motivation. So then it becomes this cycle of, oh, I love this. This feels great. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep creating. I'm going to keep doing things that are the next right step to get results. Yeah. I love that so yes. much. So, okay. Lastly, cause we're, and then we'll wrap up, but lastly, you had a big emphasis on create before you consume. And I love this because I see it all the time. People are immediately pick up their phone and start scrolling for ideas. And I know my, my clients have done this too, where, you know, they go to social media for ideas on what content to create. But all that does is put them in this place of comparison. And a lot yeah. of times it's compare and despair because then imposter syndrome kicks in or then they're saying to them, well, they've already done this. I, there's no way I'm going to get clients because they're already doing it and they already have all the clients. Look how successful they are. I'm never going to make it, blah, 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 blah. And it's just this endless vicious cycle. So I would love for you to talk about that, that the benefits of just creating before consuming. Yeah. Oh. Uh that was me, right? I used to do that all the time. I would wake up and immediately like, like, like yourself probably. And, and many of your listeners, we love to grow. We love to learn. We love to read great books. And so I would, be, I would get up and I would immediately turn on a, whether it's a podcast or a YouTube video or an audio book, like I have to be learning. If I wasn't learning, I felt like, wait, I'm, I'm wasting time. If I'm not, no. That's not wasting time. Listening to music is not a waste of time. Uh, but I just, oh, I felt that way. But what was happening was I was feeling so anxious. I mean, it would only be like eight o'clock in the morning and after my workout and all doing all the things and I'd get to my office and I already felt so overwhelmed because I had so many other people's ideas in my mind. And to your point, the comparison, I'm, I haven't gotten here yet. Look at all these successful people that I should be in a different place. We start thinking about all these things instead of, creating before we consume. So two things that I really yeah. love. So Julia Cameron has her book, uh, the, the artist way, which I recommend so often to so many people. And she talks about morning pages and morning pages is free flow writing, just stream of consciousness. First thing in the morning, right. When you wake up to just get it out, even that is amazing. And that's creating, right. You're creating, mm -hmm. you're putting something out. Even you're not showing morning pages to anyone. <laughs> you're not probably posting it on your blog, but it's such a great way to just start your day with like, what are you, what are my thoughts before I put other people's thoughts and opinions and ideas into my brain? What am I thinking about right now? What am I curious about? What am I excited about right now? Then your create your creativity for a lot of us. And I'm, and probably many of your listeners, they, they have a blog, they have a newsletter, they have a YouTube channel or a podcast, or they're writing a book. They're doing something creative. And so are you committed to, making time before you get online 
to actually do the writing or the recording or sharing a message or anything that is inspiring to you. You know, before you go on Instagram and start scrolling through everyone else, maybe you want to add something on your story. What are you thinking about this morning? What are you, what are you feeling? Because like you said, the moment that you start seeing other people's videos, you start skewing your own ideas. Cause you're like, Oh wait, maybe I should say something like that. No, you were meant to say what you wanted to say before that other stuff filled your brain and, uh, and see how you feel, recognize the difference. So let's say tomorrow you wake up and you immediately, and you're maybe, if you're already used to listening to podcasts or listening to other people, how do you feel that morning after you spent your morning listening to other people's content? And then the next day, block all that out and make time to create, whether it's writing or painting, drawing, whatever it is that you want to create and see how different you feel. That's for you to decide, right? And maybe you'll feel better the first way. I doubt it because most people who do this activity, they really recognize, wow, not only do they feel more inspired and excited, but they feel less anxious and less stressed because they feel really proud of themselves that they made time to do their creative work. They made time to do the deep work that they weren't making time for. And it's those days where I know at least for me, that I feel better. Like I do a segment in uh, Breakfast of Champions on Thursday mornings at 6.30 and I, it's a 30 minute segment. So every Thursday morning, I have to come up with something to say to a room full of people. And I get really excited about it because when I go, I wake up really early and uh, I, I wake up, I do my workout and then I go for a long walk before I do my segment. And on my walk, I'm thinking about, all right, what, what message do I want to share today? What are some things I want to do? And today it's actually, we're recording this on a Thursday. So today mm -hmm. I actually came up with, I was thinking about fear all around fear. And so I came up with this brave formula, how to start fearing less and do it and pursuing more of your dreams. And so I came up with the acronym brave and I, and I jotted all this down and I was like, Oh, it was so fun. I loved it. And then I recorded a, a YouTube video with the same content. Now, had I been listening to someone else's content, I would never have created that. Yeah. So yeah. those are the things we have to give ourselves permission to, to create before we start consuming. And this is not to say to not consume other people's work because, hey, love reading great books and discovering new podcasts and all of that. But we have to be very intentional with the time that we have. How much are you consuming versus creating? That's why I always say create before you consume because you're getting your ideas out into the world and you feel really good about it. And now you can go off and continue to learn, grow and develop with other people's information. Yeah, I love that so much. And it's so funny because I can't even tell you how many times I have had an idea in my head and I'm like, oh, I'll get to that. Or, oh, I'll, you know, I've got it written down. It's on my list, like content, some podcast episode, whatever blog. And I'll be listening to a podcast and I'm like, oh, they just did that. Like they <laughs> just did my idea. So why didn't I do that when I came up with it, you know, but you procrastinate. And so I want to encourage everyone who's listening. Like if you have an idea, run with it. Don't sit yeah. on it because then somebody else, like, I mean, let's face it. They, what do they say? There's nothing new in the world. And there really yeah. isn't, you know, we, and we all, when you, when you really look at the people you're connected with online and like, I was just doing this, um, like watching a, a, whatever. It was like a seminar type thing. And the woman speaking, I go to, go to follow her and all these people I know are already following her. And I'm like, well, how do they know her? And I didn't know her, you know, but it's so funny how we are all so connected. Our lives are so yeah. interwoven. It's really a small world. So if you have an idea, share it with the world. Don't sit on it. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Amen to that. And you know, um, I know I keep sharing books. I, I just have such a love for books, but Elizabeth, have you read Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert? Yeah, yeah. So you know how she talks about ideas? Like that's how Elizabeth shares ideas. She says, ideas are living, breathing things. And if you have an idea and you don't do anything with it, well, guess what? That idea is going to jump on over to someone else so they can use that idea. And I was like, oh, that was the most beautiful way that I've ever heard anyone describe ideas because it's so true. I mean, everybody that watches Shark Tank, I can't believe how how many how many of your friends have ever said to you, I have an 
that idea five years ago. I'm like, well, yeah, you're not the one up there pitching to Mark Cuban. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a real problem. <laughs> yes, it is a reality. So, all right, listeners, I hope you have enjoyed this episode. I love Kate's book. And I, it's funny because I read every book of everybody that I interview as well. If I know they have a book, I read their book. So uh, to me that it's just, I want to be able to sh- share effectively with everybody who's listening, but I also want to compliment you on, on the book. And so listeners, this is one of those books. It was really easy to read. Like you could even read it at night before you go to bed. It's like so light. It's nice. And it flows, it's, it's a quick read, but it, there's a ton of information in it. I was showing Kate before we started recording. My pages are dog-eared, there's highlighter, there's ink pen, there's notes, everything, the whole nine yards. So I encourage you to pick it up. I will have the link to the book in the show notes to make it easy for you. And you can just click on that and buy the book if you're interested. And Kate, will you please tell the listeners how they can connect with you, learn more from you? Yeah, you can. The easiest way to find me is uh, on katevolman.com. But like most of us, I'm all over on social. My two main platforms are, uh, I use Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. I've been doing a lot more over on YouTube. So if you have a YouTube channel, then go connect with me on YouTube and we can be YouTube friends. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Listeners, if you enjoyed this episode, will you please share it with someone you know who I don't know, maybe they're in a funk, maybe they feel stuck, maybe they just are, I don't know, not feeling great, not motivated, because I really think tapping into their creativity may help them. So if you know someone like that, please share the episode. And if you would be so kind to leave a rating and review, you know, as I always say, my heart would be so full and I would appreciate you so much because that helps me be able to get great guests like Kate on the show. Kate, thanks for being here. Oh, Robin, thank you so much. You are such a delight. I really enjoy your podcast and thank you for your bravery and courage in creating something and putting it out into the world for to help so many people. Thank you.